Last week when I talked about the Black Sea and the war in Ukraine, I somewhat glossed over the role of one incredibly important strategic participant. With a growing defence industry, powerful military, existing relations with both Russia and Ukraine, and the privileged ability to control passage in and out of the Black Sea, it's hard to truly understand the overarching strategic situation in Ukraine without talking about the key role the Turkish government plays. I think it's fair to say that since February 2022, coverage in the Western media of the Turkish role in the war has been mixed. Sometimes the Turkish president, Erdogan, is depicted as being a close friend of Putin, with the emphasis placed on things like Ankara's decision not to join all of the EU sanctions against Russia, to continue trading with and indeed even expanding its trade with the Russian Federation, or blocking, for many months, Sweden's accession to NATO. But on the other hand, the nation is sometimes shown being an ally to Ukraine. Turkish efforts were critical to the birth of the grain deal that allowed Ukraine to export its agricultural produce for more than a year. The Turkish government has been one of the clearer ones in supporting Ukraine regaining all of its conquered territory and having its territorial integrity respected. And some of Ukraine's most famous weapon systems, like the Bayraktar TB2 drone, have been supplied, often free of charge, by Turkish companies. Actions that would be pretty hard to square with any thesis that had the Turks as secret Russian allies. Instead, a number of commentators would suggest that Ankara's strategy in Ukraine is one of very careful and complex balance. One that reflects the country's unique position, strategic circumstances and capabilities. Today, we will try and break down and understand that strategy just a little bit better. We'll look at the nation's military and military industrial potential, economic struggles, potential goals and objectives in Ukraine, and its immense ability to potentially influence that war going forward. So what am I going to be talking about today? I'll open, as I often do, with a little bit of history. And because the scope of Turkish history is so vast and so well documented, I'm going to try and keep this narrow, focusing specifically on the history as it relates to the Black Sea, Ukraine, Russia, and the country's accession to NATO. Then we're going to talk about their current role within NATO and their strategic outlook, again, focused on the Black Sea region. From there, we will finally have a detailed look at the Turkish military and the supporting defence industrial base, the growing strength of which will make for an interesting contrast with the other key point of context, the Turkish economy. With all that context in place, we'll finally look at Ankara's role in the war in Ukraine in detail, their relationship with Russia, their relationship with Ukraine, and by looking at the role Ankara has played in shaping the war so far, we'll try to at least partially address two questions that always seem to spin around in the media. Firstly, whose side, for lack of a better term, are they on? And what roles do they have the potential to play shaping this war going forward? But before I jump into it, a quick word from a sponsor. And today I once again welcome back my VPN of choice and a returning sponsor, Private Internet Access. Now, I think it's fair to assume that Prigozhin didn't plan the Wagner mutiny using unsecured airport Wi-Fi. Although some of the group's past experiences do make it clear that you should probably be careful about what information makes it online. That can be pretty hard when even a casual Google search will reveal plenty of cases of major data breaches. Social networks, government organisations, network operators. There are recent cases of all of them being breached and customer privacy being breached with it. Now, unless you happen to be Mark Zuckerberg or a cybersecurity agency, there's probably not too much you can do about that. But you can adopt a collection of tools and practices designed to help protect your privacy online. And one of those tools can be a VPN. Using a VPN, just one or two clicks can help conceal your IP address, reroute your internet traffic, and help protect your privacy, especially on public networks. And when it comes to issues like data breaches, private internet access has a particular advantage, because they advertise an independently audited no-logs policy. And even the best hacker out there is going to struggle to steal data that doesn't exist. This probably won't save you if you insist on responding to every spam email with your full name, address, date of birth, and credit card information but it may help shift the needle on your online privacy. The service also allows you to connect to VPN servers in 84 countries worldwide, and a subscription allows you to protect an unlimited number of individual devices, all while being available across multiple platforms and being compatible with a range of streaming services. And so if you're interested, please check out the link in the description below. It'll give you 83% off a two-year subscription, plus four bonus months, all protected, of course, by a 30-day money-back guarantee. Okay, I'm just going to add one caveat up front about naming. In June last year, the Turkish government asked that at the UN and in certain other contexts, that the Turkish form of the name, and here forgive my pronunciation, Turkiye, be used instead of the name Turkey. So I'm going to do my best with the name, but if I do ever flip back to the more familiar Turkey, please forgive me. The other caveat's the usual one regarding politics. This video is not intended as an endorsement or a criticism of any particular national policy. I'm trying to describe what is not whether it's right or wrong. All right, so let's jump into some history. 
and because if we tried to cover the whole thing, we'd be three hours in before I made my way out of the Balkans, let's talk specifically about the Black Sea region and Crimea. Before there was a modern Turkish Republic, there was the Ottoman Empire, a great power that dominated the Black Sea for centuries, and whose territories at their height ran from what was then the Austrian border to Basra in Iraq. And as well as direct territorial holdings, like many empires, the Ottomans also had protectorates and vassals, regions or states that might largely administer themselves and have their own military forces, but who owed some sort of fealty to Constantinople, then the capital of the Ottoman Empire. And among those protectorates from approximately 1475 was the so-called Crimean Khanate. This was a realm populated primarily by Muslim Crimean Tatars. The Crimean Tatars, by the way, are usually considered a Turkic ethnic group. So by that logic, I think we should expect Ankara to declare a special military operation to liberate Crimea from Russia any day now. This is always the problem with trying to redraw borders in the modern day based on so-called historical claims. You're usually going to have a lot of different clashing claims depending on how far back you choose to define the history. Centuries before the Mongol invasions that indirectly led to the Crimean Khanate, it was the Grand Princes of Kiev who had taken much of Crimea in the 10th century. Heck, go back far enough and you can bring the Italians in as a potential tiebreaker. After all, much of the area belonged to a client kingdom of the Roman Empire. And if they do decide to sponsor a referendum, I'm sure the Greeks will want to be engaged as well having settled a number of colonies in the Black Sea coast in the past. Jokes aside, hopefully you see the problem with this kind of historical regression. Eventually, you just have to stop and say the borders are the borders. And the modern Turkish state clearly recognises Crimea as part of Ukraine. But at the height of the Ottoman Empire, it was clearly a region under Turkish influence. Over the centuries, however, and for reasons that could make up a video or two of their own, the Ottoman Empire grew weaker. And as it did, the Russian Empire grew stronger. Without a strong benefactor, the Crimean Khanate also grew more vulnerable. And in 1783, arguably in breach of a previous treaty in 1774, the Russian Empire under Catherine the Great annexed Crimea. Under Russian rule, there'd be an increasing number of ethnic Slavs in the Crimean population and significant emigration among the Crimean Tatars. But another dramatic demographic event to use the most YouTube-friendly language possible, would take place under Stalin's rule. In 1944, Stalin would order that all the Crimean Tatars be deported from Crimea. Hundreds of thousands would be removed as part of the process. Many would not survive. And it wasn't until the reforms of the Gorbachev era that many Tatars were able to return. That helps explain why in the modern day the Tatars only make up a significant minority of the Crimean population and the largest proportion of the global Crimean Tatar population actually resides within Turkish territory. And in a number of speeches, including one from 2018, the Turkish government has committed itself to, quote, continue to defend the rights and interests of the Crimean Tatars, irrespective of whether they live in Crimea or had to leave the region following the occupation, end quote. I bring this up to stress the fact that even though modern Turkey has no claim to Crimea or any of these territories, there are still historical and ethnic reasons alongside matters of strategy that explains why any Turkish government is always going to be highly invested in things that happen in the Black Sea and specifically in Crimea. Politics can encourage people to conveniently forget a great many things. But when you're talking about demography altering events, some things are just too indelible to be easily forgotten. But any action on that point has always been tempered by a reality. And that is that from Catherine the Great to the present day, the Ottoman Empire and then the Turkish Republic have always been militarily and economically overmatched, whether by the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, or the Russian Federation. That fact ultimately led the country to join NATO, and throughout the Cold War, the Turkish Republic was NATO's anchor on the Black Sea, at a time where other modern NATO states like Romania and Bulgaria were in fact part of the Warsaw Pact. It was the Turkish Republic that gave NATO the keys to the Black Sea. It was Turkey that gave NATO the ability to bottle up the Russian Black Sea fleet in event of war. And these and other phenomena make Turkey's story as part of NATO one of the most interesting of any member state. And given just how important it is to current events, I thought it might be worth quickly talking about the role that the Turks play as part of NATO. Because here again, I often see Turkey portrayed as a blocker within the alliance. Some coverage has sought to describe the Turks as somehow anti-NATO. At the extreme, you might even see allegations that Ankara functions as a sort of agent of Russia within the alliance. I think it's fair to say, however, that at the very least, those arguments miss some of the nuances of Turkish foreign policy. 
the Turks have some deep points of contention with many EU and NATO member states. But that doesn't mean that they are anti-NATO. So let's quickly ask the question, how did the Turks end up joining NATO and what's their current opinion of it? The Turkish Republic expresses an interest in joining NATO basically as soon as the organisation is created. In terms of the why they were keen, there were a couple of elements which may have contributed. For one, the Soviets had expressed a desire to renegotiate the 1925 Treaty of Friendship and Non-Aggression between the Turkish Republic and the Soviet Union, and also to consider revising the terms of the Montreux Convention. Now, the Montreux Convention is the document governing maritime traffic up and down the Dardanelles Strait. It's an agreement which gave and still gives Turkey a significant role, and indeed significant rights, to control the transit particularly of warships between the Black Sea and the Bosphorus and Mediterranean. For reasons that include the fact that these straits pass through the city of Istanbul, the Turks have historically taken the convention very, very seriously. And telling them that you would like to renegotiate it is kind of like telling Egypt that you'd like to take back the Suez Canal, or telling the Americans that they should allow the Russian Navy unlimited basing rights in New York Harbour. The Treaty of Friendship and Non-Aggression, meanwhile, was the treaty that basically said we will not invade you. So the Turks basically had a situation where a very powerful neighbouring state was telling them that they would like to renegotiate the pillar of their national security strategy, while also revising the agreement that prevented them shooting people as part of their negotiation strategy. Now, sometimes in international relations, these sort of requests might be treated as just veiled threats or negotiating strategies. But the Turkish Republic presumably realised it was negotiating literally with Stalin, someone who had a little bit of form when it came to invading neighbouring countries and so did what many other nations did before and since, and tried to sign up with the biggest, scariest alliance in the neighbourhood, which was NATO. It's worth noting that the original applications didn't really come to much. The alliance was in fact quite divided on Turkey as a potential member. So in a geostrategic sense, the Turks decided to audition, if you like, for the role. The Turkish government decided to send troops to fight in the Korean War. Almost 15,000 Turks would serve over the course of the Korean War, and the Turkish Brigade would earn a presidential unit citation from the Americans. Over the course of the war, about 20% of all Turks who served would become casualties. And in the 1950s, there was a much stronger push for both Turkey and Greece, who had also fought in the Korean War, to be admitted into NATO. Turkey and Greece would both join NATO in 1952 at exactly the same time. The reason for that particular timing is both symbolic and very, very practical. As everyone who has observed from the efforts of Finland and Sweden to join the alliance, any new member of NATO requires the approval of all other members of NATO, which meant that in the case of Turkey and Greece, if one state was allowed to join before the other, even if by a matter of days, the new member hypothetically could have, and may well have, immediately turned around and blocked its neighbour from entering. As it was, both states were able to successfully join the alliance. And over the course of the Cold War, Turkey played home to a number of NATO bases, including a number of US nuclear weapon systems, a small number of which are still present in the country today under a nuclear sharing arrangement. Because so far as guarantees against Soviet aggression go, NATO membership and US troops and nuclear weapons on your soil is about as good a guarantee as you're going to get short of your own nuclear weapons program. Now, critically, none of this means Ankara sees eye to eye with all of its NATO allies on everything. In fact, it'd probably be fair to say they spend a lot of time sort of staring awkwardly past one another into the vague distance. The Turks and the Greeks, for example, have some of NATO's greatest stockpiles of tanks, artillery and manpower and spend an awful lot of time pointing most of it at each other, meaning there can genuinely be times where the phrase strengthening the southern flank of NATO can refer to situations where NATO states are arming themselves to defend themselves against NATO states. There are tensions with many other NATO members over those members' attitudes towards various Kurdish groups, as well as Turkish actions in places like Syria, the situation on Cyprus, American refusal to extradite Mohammed Gulen, who currently lives in Pennsylvania, and a long, long, long list of other outstanding points of difference, from refugees to Turkish EU membership prospects to relationships with Russia. Suffice to say that if you're at a NATO dinner party and the Turks are present, there's a very long list of topics that are not suitable for polite conversation. And that's before we even touch on the fact that a number of Turkish organisations and entities are actively sanctioned by other members of NATO for various reasons. Back in April this year, for example, it was announced the US had imposed sanctions on four Turkish companies. In that case, for allegedly violating US export controls and indirectly assisting the Russian war effort. Basically, what I'm trying to say is this is not a case of everyone being on the same page. 
Some of these differences were very publicly highlighted by the position Ankara took on the proposal to bring Finland and Sweden into NATO. The Turks originally blocked both Finland and Sweden, and very publicly refused to let Sweden into the alliance if it didn't agree to and then adhere to a number of conditions. Those conditions included Sweden dropping controls on arms exports to Turkey, expanding what Ankara would call the fight against terrorism in all its forms, and Sweden promising to actively support efforts to reinvigorate Turkey's EU membership bid. Some reporting also suggests that Erdogan used the matter to also put pressure on the United States. There, there are a wide range of topics that might benefit from further negotiation, including, for example, the further export of American F-16s for the Turkish Air Force. These Turkish negotiating strategies created some public frustration in some NATO countries, and along with Ankara's failure to copy the European Union sanctions on Russia, led to some claims the Turkish government was operating in opposition to NATO. But of course, the reality isn't that simple. I think part of the problem is that we as members of the public often expect that between any two countries, every interaction will be either positive or negative. If you're friends, you'll tell each other everything, agree on everything, and turn up to social events in matching outfits. And if you're enemies, you will wake up every morning with no issue on your agenda other than making life for your enemy as difficult as possible. Now, that's not how foreign policy works in general and has between zero and no relationship with how Turkish foreign policy works. And here I want to steal a quote from a former Assistant Secretary General of NATO and the former Turkish Permanent Representative to NATO and the OSCE, Takan Ildem. He described Turkish policy as being capable of, quote, careful compartmentalization of strategic interests and divergences, end quote. He was talking there primarily about Ankara's relationship with Moscow, but the principle also applies elsewhere. Whereas some nations might see a relationship holistically, and if you ever wrong them on one, you're dead to them forever, Turkish policy carefully segregates different issues. It acknowledges that you might be a fierce adversary with another country on one issue, but that doesn't prevent you being close allies and friends on another. And because of that, when you're trying to evaluate the Turkish role on the war in Ukraine, I think it's important to look at topics individually. Turkey, for example, opposes most sanctions imposed against the Russian Federation. But it's also been a strong advocate for NATO expansion, something that Moscow deeply opposes. And Ankara has previously publicly backed both Ukrainian and Georgian membership in the Defense Alliance. Back in 2020, the Turkish foreign minister even went so far as to try and call out some of the Western allies, saying that, quote, we are criticized for having better relations with Russia as a neighbor, but our Western friends are not agreeing to invite Georgia because they don't want to provoke Russia. So what happens when you segment out the issues and look at Turkish opinion on NATO specifically? And here we can look at some opinion polling data gathered before the July NATO summit. For these results, what I've done is pulled out all the neutral or non-responses so you only have positive and negative compared directly against each other. And what they seem to show is pretty broad Turkish public support for the alliance. 91.5% favoring increased defense spending, 89.4% saying NATO is important for national security, 82% saying that they would vote to remain in the alliance if given a chance, and more than 88% of respondents that gave either a firm positive or negative response said that they believed their country should go to the defense of another NATO ally if it were attacked. In the case of all of these questions, these rates are either in line with or above the NATO averages, which means from a public opinion perspective at least, Turkey is a very interesting NATO ally. They're kind of like that friend who will bitterly argue with you over just about anything. Where there are arguments, they'll call you out on it. On some deeply held issues, they may curse you to your face. And if you're Greece and it's a particularly bad day, they may ask you to meet them in the car park. But if you're ever in trouble and the beacons are lit, then these figures suggest they are going to fix bayonets and be there. Just as when this year's earthquake hit, damaging or destroying the lives of hundreds of thousands of Turks, it was the foreign minister from Greece who was one of the first foreign representatives to arrive, offering aid. Obviously, we can't be sure if Turkish government policy would align with the public opinion of the Turkish population. But if you refer to statements by the Turkish foreign ministry on NATO, they state that, quote, ever since our NATO membership in 1952, the North Atlantic Alliance has played a central role in Turkey's security and contributed to its integration with the Euro-Atlantic community, quote. In short, Ankara's official position is not hostile to NATO. In fact, Turkish support for the alliance is pretty high, but it's a support that always has to be viewed through the lens of the many, many situations where the opinions of the Turks and various other NATO members diverge, 
and the country's unique and diverse strategic interests. Which brings us quite neatly to a quick discussion of some of those overarching strategic interests and the way they have shaped the Turkish military and defence industrial base. While the term is perhaps an imperfect one, Turkey could perhaps be described as a regional power. It's a relatively populous nation of about 85 million people with a GDP of approximately 900 billion US dollars. So far as its geographic position goes, there's the good and then there's the interesting. The good is that the nation controls the Dardanelles Straits, borders the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, which is fantastic for trade, which only adds to the economic potential of a country with a relatively solid demographic pyramid and positive population growth. The interesting comes when you start to bring in the neighbours. After all, this is a nation that borders such interesting holiday destinations as Syria and Iraq, as well as Iran, Armenia, Georgia, Bulgaria, Greece, and if you take the Black Sea into account, arguably Russia and Ukraine as well. Now, in a military sense, having a lot of neighbours isn't necessarily a problem. If, and that's a very big if, you get along with all of them and none of them pose a significant threat. But the Turkish heartland is in between the Balkans and the Middle East, two historical thunderdomes that aren't exactly famed for their stability. And as a result, Ankara has many, many zones of strategic interest most of which are well beyond the scope of this presentation. To the north, there's the Black Sea and Russia. To the west, there's Greece, with disputes over the continental shelf, resources and other matters. Then as you rotate round, you find Cyprus. Then Syria, where the Turkish military is active in the northern parts of the country. As well as Iraq, Iran and a Kurdish population that numbers in the tens of millions that crosses national boundaries. And that matters because the conflict between Ankara and certain Kurdish organisations could fully occupy an episode or two. In short, as I said before, it's a very interesting neighbourhood. And as you'd expect, the nature of that interesting neighbourhood shapes the Turkish military. And since the strength of that military directly informs the potential influence the Turks might have in the Russia-Ukraine war, I want to finally have a close look at that military now. If you were to compare the Turkish army to other forces we've looked at, it has more in common with that of, say, Korea than it does of something like France. This is one of the largest armies in NATO, still very much conscription-based, with about 260,000 active personnel and another 260,000 in reserve. Then there's the sort of park of armour and artillery you'd expect if you wanted your army to fight a major conventional war. There are reportedly 2,400 main battle tanks of various types, plus a whole bunch of older ones in storage, more than 5,000 armoured personnel carriers, more than half of which are various M113 models, all supported by an artillery park that includes more than 140 MLRS systems, more than 1,000 self-propelled guns, a menagerie of towed howitzers, and almost 6,000 mortars of various types. In terms of equipment composition, this is a mostly basics force with a sprinkling of bling. The tank force, for example, operates everything from upgraded M60s and Leopard 1A3s up to Leopard 2A4s, with very small numbers of new generation main battle tanks only just about to enter service. On top of all of this, there's a very large gendarmerie force answering to the Ministry of the Interior. They're not included in the figures on the slide here, but given they roll around in enough organic armoured vehicles like BTRs to make even the most militarised US police force envious, I think it would be wrong to write them off as a force in the event of a major war. The Turkish Air Force similarly is largely designed for operations close to Turkish territory. The Air Force operates more than 300 combat aircraft with the core of the fleet being the American-designed F-16. In their F-16s, the Turkish pilots regularly participate in NATO air exercises. It should be noted that over the last couple of years, Turkish and Greek pilots have also had plenty of opportunities to accumulate additional flying hours and experience regularly intercepting and locking up each other. Attempts to upscale and modernise the Turkish Air Force are interesting from a geopolitical perspective. The nation was originally part of the F-35 program, but was ejected after it purchased S-400 air defence systems from Russia. One of the big concerns there being that you probably don't want to allow your stealth aircraft to be scanned constantly by a Russian air defence system. And if the Turks had both F-35 and S-400, it'd be pretty hard to stop them practicing against themselves, and in so doing, perhaps developing techniques or lessons that might be useful to Russian operators. The Turkish Air Force also wants to purchase many additional F-16 platforms for the fleet, something which came up repeatedly when negotiating Sweden's entry into NATO. 
And while those negotiations were proceeding, Turkish companies were also receiving contracts to upgrade some of the nation's oldest F-16 models themselves, equipping them with things like a Turkish-designed IESA radar and extending their lifespan for an additional 6,000 hours per airframe, a figure which presumably causes MiG-31 pilots to have a stroke upon hearing it, given that that aircraft's robust Soviet engineering was originally good for about 2,500 hours, and with a modern service life extension program can be stretched to 3,500. We've talked about the Turkish Navy before as one of the heavy hitters in the Black Sea. With 12 submarines, 16 frigates of various types, and 45 patrol and coastal combatants, the Turks can put a lot of hulls in the water compared to the Russians or anyone else on the Black Sea. When you add in air power and other ship types, the force is all the more impressive. But I'll add the caveat here that most of these units are on the lighter side. When you think of Turkish Navy ships, don't think of the super destroyers of the Korean Navy that we just covered. The Black Sea and the Mediterranean aren't the Pacific, and the ship designs here reflect that. It's also interesting to note that Turkish shipyards are constructing two corvettes for Ukraine. Those, as you can imagine, are being safely kept where they are as work continues. But given present circumstances, it'll be interesting to see what armament package the Ukrainians ultimately opt for and whether it consists in whole or in part of looking at all the available missile systems and saying yes. The frame on top of this is that the Turkish military is very much one that is in the midst of a technical transition. Usually militaries are talking about modernising a couple of systems at any given time. The Turkish armed forces, by contrast, are modernising a whole bunch of systems at more or less the same time. Whether you're talking about tanks, artillery, fighters or drones, there's probably a new system in the pipeline. And one thing that I think will be very interesting for foreign observers to watch is not just how the Turkish military chooses to deploy new equipment, but also some of the new concepts it chooses to test. The flagship of the Turkish Navy, for example, is an amphibious assault vessel. And while, like many AAVs, it will operate rotary-winged aircraft, so helicopters, it also looks like the Turkish Navy intends to deploy it as a combat drone carrier using the relatively small vessel by carrier standards to launch fixed-wing combat drones. That's not an entirely new concept, but for many navies it's likely to be an interesting one. All else being equal, combat drones can be smaller than manned aircraft because they don't need to fit the squishy pilots. And so with the cockpit and egos removed, these systems can potentially be made small enough to operate from ships of this type. But for all that new equipment to appear, it has to be purchased. And given the sheer number of systems slated to enter Turkish military service in the coming years, you might be wondering how on earth they plan on affording any of this. After all, according to official NATO figures, Turkey is slated to spend about 15.8 billion US dollars equivalent on defence in 2023. And if you remember your GDP estimates from earlier, that puts the funding level below NATO's 2% target. And yet the country has one of NATO's larger militaries, some of its largest equipment stocks, and appears to be capable of developing and fielding new and modern weapon systems in increasing numbers. So short of Erdogan discovering some sort of cheat code in reality, how on earth is that possible? Part of the answer, as is usually the case, is our old friend defence purchasing power parity. What sort of value a country tends to get back in exchange for its defence expenditure? Going by the Robertson figures that date back to 2019, Turkey's PPP multiplier is high, very high. At a calculated multiplier of 3.3, Turkey's defence budget estimate of 15.8 billion US dollars would become just over 47 billion dollars, which immediately jumps you up to the budgetary levels of a country like France without the need to have a budget line for nuclear warning shots. As a multiplier, that's closer to the level of India or Russia than to other European states, and well above that calculated for the People's Republic of China. The Turkish military having a high PPP makes a degree of sense. It has a lot of the characteristics of other forces that also tend to have high multipliers. For one, it has a conscription-based manpower pool, and wages do tend to be lower when you literally cannot refuse the employment contract. Please no one tell Jeff Bezos that before Amazon gets ideas. And then also, like the Republic of Korea, it's got a reasonably robust domestic defense manufacturing base in a country where wages and costs tend to be lower. You see, unless you have a serious comparative advantage, manufacturing your own equipment in a high-cost economy might not do you any favours. If Ireland, for example, decided to manufacture its own tanks, then the likely per-unit cost would pose a serious threat to the sanity of any auditing officer that had to review the business case. But if you can manufacture a bunch of your kit in your own middle-income economy, 
then all else being equal, there might be savings to be made. But that only speaks to the efficiency of every dollar spent. What it doesn't speak to is the fact the number of dollars spent may in fact be wrong. Let me put it this way. Defining military spending in general is difficult. Calculating military expenditure somewhere like Russia is extraordinarily difficult. But the Turkish military is one which has dealt with on and off sanctions from various states for more than half a century. And faced with those sort of circumstances, your defence spending picture can tend to become a little bit murky. In the case of the Turkish armed forces, for example, there are a couple of components we can consider. There's the regular defence budget, simple enough. But then you might have closed or classified funding going through the office of the president, funding funneled through the Ministry of Treasury and Finance, and then organisations like the Turkish Armed Forces Foundation, which is, as you might suspect, a foundation aimed literally at increasing the warfighting capacity of the Turkish Armed Forces. The foundation invests, among other things, in building up the Turkish indigenous defence industrial base and has grown to the point where, according to its own material, it supervises or monitors a total of 15 companies. Now, the foundation is not fully separate and distinct from the state. It is a creation of Turkish law. And if you look at the board of trustees, it might suggest some linkages with the Turkish government, with President Erdogan being the chairman of the board of trustees and the other members, including the vice president, the minister of defence, the commander of the Turkish armed forces and the president of defence industries. But in other respects, this is very much a foundation. It collects donations, including from the public. Go to their website and you too can click a button to donate to the Turkish defence industrial base by credit card or other payment methods. And go elsewhere on the website and you'll find testimonials purportedly from ordinary Turks who have decided to donate their personal funds, property, or make a provision in their will to support the Turkish armed forces. Now, in some countries, this sort of behaviour might seem unusual. Americans, for example, are generally considered pretty patriotic people, but no one's entering their credit card details on a GoFundMe to buy the US Air Force another B-21 Raider. But in other countries, funding military capabilities through public donations is absolutely a genuine phenomenon. In Ukraine, for example, volunteers and donations are a serious contributor to the readiness of many Ukrainian military units. And if you go back through history, there are plenty of other examples you can find. For example, because every Perun video needs at least one obscure piece of historical trivia, this is an image of a Portuguese warship constructed in the 1890s. She was literally built using public donations by citizens who thought the Portuguese Navy needed some additional punch. So maybe the next time the US Navy is having trouble with its build program, they should pass the hat around in public and see how much American citizens will pay in order to name America's next principal surface combatant the Shippy McShipface. Then there are businesses. A good example here is OYAK. This is a fund which ultimately represents one of the largest Turkish industrial groups. It has interests in everything from car manufacturing to steel foundries to mining to power generation and is closely linked with the military and serves essentially as its pension fund. Whether you think its services and activities should be included in defence spending ultimately depends on the model and definitions you're using. But it does help highlight some of the problem here. There are a lot of ways for funds to find their way into supporting military readiness in this country. So if you ask me how much is spent on defence in Turkey, my answer is going to be, I don't know. But through private and public funding sources, it's enough to fund a significant defence industrial program. And it's that program we're going to cover now, because Ankara has long placed the emphasis on increasing Turkey's defence industrial base. And you could argue the war in Ukraine has become part of their strategy to do so. Historically, the Turkish military has largely relied on imported heavy weapons and equipment. Much of its kit, for example, came from the United States or later Germany. Imports continued in recent years, and between 2013 and 2022, according to Cipri's methodology, about three-fifths of imports were aircraft, followed by missiles and sensors. However, imports have also been complicated by sanctions and restrictions on several occasions. For example, in 2018, after the Turkish military deployed a number of Leopard 2A4 tanks into Syria, the German government announced a delay in its decision on approving upgrades to the vehicles. Other examples include the nation being removed from the F-35 program and contention with countries like Sweden and the United States over arms importation. Eager to have a supply of modern weapon systems, but not eager to give up control over how those systems are used, Ankara has long looked for ways to build more of its equipment itself. 
Goals for greater domestic production and development were set over a number of strategic plans. A 2017 document, for example, set a number of specific targets. For example, that the country be able to produce an indigenous engine for key land platforms by 2021, and that the first new generation Turkish MBTs be available by 2020. Going over these lists in 2023, it's clear the Turks hit some of their goals and missed some of the others. But there was clear forward movement towards having a better export portfolio of products, and also production lines for more equipment that the Turkish military itself might be interested in. Some Turkish export systems focused on relatively familiar weapon systems. There is, for example, a largely Turkish infantry fighting vehicle that is not going to be operated by the Turkish military as far as we know, but which sold hundreds of units for operation in countries like the UAE. Perhaps the most famous Turkish export offerings have been the drones produced by the company Baikar, with perhaps their most well-known offering being the Bayraktar TB2. As a drone, the TB2 did not have all the same capabilities of something like the American MQ-9 Reaper. But that's kind of like saying a Toyota Corolla can't match the latest Lamborghini. Most of the time, it doesn't bloody need to. And unless you're selling a dodgy online crypto or forex trading course, you don't need a car that can do 0 to 103 and a half seconds. And so the Bayraktar TB2 conquered significant parts of the global market by being affordably good enough for many buyers. And after its performance in the earlier stages of the war in Ukraine made the drone so famous, orders for the unit quite quickly skyrocketed. But as far as the Turkish drone program goes, you could argue the TB2 is far from the top of the capability spectrum. Nor are drones the only system where the Turkish DIB is focusing significant development effort. Another suite of products, for example, is guided munitions. And here, Turkish industry is developing a range of systems intended both for use with domestic Turkish platforms but also some foreign platforms. For example, they've developed their own air-launched cruise missile. Compared to something like Storm Shadow, this system's got a smaller warhead and probably a shorter range, but it's also both lighter and cheaper. And critically, for a range of potential future users, it's designed to be fired from F-16. At the other extreme, you have micro-munitions designed to be fired from small drones, and even a miniature air-launched cruise missile designed to be fired again from drone platforms. On paper, that system is reported to have a 30 kilogram warhead and a range of about 100 kilometers, plus a significant surveillance suite and impressive camera, which basically makes the missile a small drone in and of itself, because the Turks presumably couldn't resist adding drones to the drones so you could drone people while you droned them. But that's enough of a quick look around Turkish armament offerings. Let's zoom out and ask the question, is it working? Looking at just Cypri arms export figures gives one answer to that question. What you've got here is arms exports for the years 2014 to 16, 17 to 19, and 20 to 22. Keep in mind here that the y-axis is so-called trend indicator value, not any value of US dollars. It's an artificial measure that lets you compare one year to another without worrying too much about inflation or exchange rates, but it doesn't map cleanly to any given currency. But looking at those charts, you see a very roughly 80% increase between 2014 and 2016 on one hand, and 2020 to 22 on the other. That growth is largely driven by two factors, an increase in armoured vehicle exports, and a very significant increase in that red bar that represents aircraft exports, which in this case is overwhelmingly sales to the expanding TB2 fan club. So at this point, you might stop and say, hey, 80% increase, that's really impressive but you'd still only be telling half the story. Because what I'm now showing you on this chart is both arms exports, but also arms imports. And what this shows is that yes, arms exports have expanded considerably, but that arms imports have collapsed to something like a quarter of their former value. The reason that matters is because Turkish industry isn't designing these products just to sell them on the international market. Although, make no mistake, if you would like to buy some TB2 drones, they would probably love to have a word with you. But they're also designing products to reduce dependence on imports. And while figures like this are always going to be complicated by the bumpiness of specific orders or a dozen other limitations, at the very least, this does suggest they're having some success in doing so. But I'm going to end this section with a warning. Turkish ambitions cover a range of very high commitment programs, some of which are very ambitious in scope. Some of these are targeting markets that are arguably easier to break into than others, and indeed some have already broken into their target market. Turns out that blowing up a bunch of Russian air defense systems, for example, is pretty good marketing material for your drone of choice. 
But that doesn't mean that all Turkish products are going to have a smooth ride. And so for the sake of balance, I wanted to give one example here. The Turks have a fifth-generation fighter program, the TAI Khan, or simply the TF. The aircraft is still in the development iteration phase and is slated to enter service with the Turkish Air Force somewhere between the very late 2020s and very early 2030s. The rough currently estimated price point is around 100 million US dollars per unit. And as we all know, major weapon systems always come in under budget and never ever go over. But if those numbers hold, the TF would be entering the market in the 2030s, trying to compete against aircraft that already will have been serviced for many years, like the F-35, or by that point, the Korean KF-21. Indeed, by 2030, we may even be seeing the first sixth-generation fighters take the field. Against those competitors, the TF is probably going to struggle to provide the same or greater capability at the same or lower price point because the sheer scale of the F-35 fleet just makes it more economical to invest very heavily in upgrade packages. Now, the obvious answer is that TF is meant to be a product that you can sell to people who don't want an American fighter, or indeed a Korean one. It's meant to be an indigenous platform that isn't bound by the export restrictions of other countries, which is really inconvenient because the initial examples of the TF we've seen fly are using American F-110 engines. Now for testing, there's nothing wrong with that, a lot of aircraft do it. Engines are hard, some of the hardest part of developing an aircraft. And using an F-110 is basically a cheat code any designer can go to if they would like their aircraft prototype to fly good. But in order to make the TF concept work as intended, the Turkish industry is going to need a Turkish engine. One which they own the IP to and which is not export controlled by any foreign country. Now that's possible. I'm not putting it past Turkish industry, but it introduces a heck of a lot of technical risk to the program. Just ask the Indians who first ran their GTX 35 engine in 1996 and are still working on it. For me, there is enormous potential for programs like this to eat up enormous amounts of funding. And as we're about to discuss, funding might not be something that Ankara has in infinite amounts, because the final bit of context to the Turkish strategy I want to discuss today is the relatively fragile state of the Turkish economy. In some ways, the Turkish economy has a lot going for it. It's well positioned for market access into the Mediterranean, Central Asia, Russia, and the European Union. It has a relatively young and growing workforce. And between 2000 and 2010, the country saw truly explosive levels of GDP growth. But unfortunately for basically all of us, 2023 is not 2005. And the story of the Turkish economy in more recent years is not quite so happy. One of the biggest issues has been rampant inflation. This has been a pain point for many countries around the world in recent years. In the worst affected EU states, for example, inflation in some cases crossed into the double digits. Inflation peaks like 11% in the United Kingdom were enough to push cost of living to the top of voters' agendas. But offer the Turks an 11% annual rate of inflation and they would take it in a heartbeat. There, based on the official CPI, prices have more than doubled since late 2021. They're up 13 times over since 2003. And if you're looking for a comparison there, the US CPI has roughly tripled since 1984. Just don't ask them what houses used to cost. But in order to combat recent inflation, many governments have responded by raising their interest rates. However, President Erdogan has on a number of occasions defended an alternative economic thesis, that low interest rates help fight inflation, which to defenders of more conventional policy options makes about as much sense as trying to solve a budget deficit by making all taxes optional. There's unconventional, and then there's unconventional. And part of the issue comes from the capacity for inflation to become self-reinforcing. Think about it this way. If you're an ordinary Turk and you have a supply of Turkish currency, the lira, and you think that the price of stuff and things is going to go up relative to the currency, one, you can convert your lira into a foreign currency that you don't think is going to lose value relative to real assets, something like dollars or euros. Or two, you can just spend your lira now before they lose value relative to the things that you want to buy. Maybe that means purchasing hard assets that you think will hold value, or maybe it just means buying a bunch of imported goods that will go up in price later on. The problem is, because now everyone is spending as quickly as possible, inflation is going to go higher, which is going to prompt people to spend even more, even quicker. Combine that with low interest rates and you have a potentially deadly combination. 
Because if, say, for example, I can borrow at 5% interest, but I think my money is going to lose 10% of its value every year, then the real cost of borrowing money is actually negative. And spending, like an NBA star that just got their first multi-million dollar check, becomes, in a weird way, a somewhat rational thing to do. But if an entire country starts converting its domestic currency holdings into dollars or euros, or massively consuming foreign imported goods, then the result is going to be downward pressure on the national currency as more and more of it gets dumped on the market. The lira over the last decade or more has faced this problem, although arguably it was less a case of down pressure and more a case of a long drawn out execution. In January of 2008, a Turkish lira would buy approximately 85 US cents. At time of recording, that figure was less than 4 cents, meaning that in a little over 15 years, the lira had fallen to 1 20th of its initial value. Even if you only want to look more recently, relative to the US dollar, the lira has lost more than two thirds of its value since January 2020. And that's even with the Turkish government making extensive efforts to help protect the lira's value. The Turkish Central Bank, for example, has engaged in lira buying campaigns where they use foreign currency to purchase lira on the market in order to try and hold up its value. And then to try and convince Turks not to convert their lira into foreign currencies, they also created what are called foreign exchange protected accounts. These are basically savings accounts where you can deposit your lira and earn interest as normal. But at maturity, not only do you receive your interest payment from wherever you're depositing it, but the government will also top up your account to reflect any foreign exchange depreciation. So if in the time you put your money away, the lira halved against the comparison currency, the government will just double your money, leaving you financially in the same position you would be if the currency had not gone down. In one sense, this acts to protect the currency by encouraging people not to convert their lira into dollars or euros. You can keep your money in lira, put it in an interest-bearing account, and earn a pretty good interest rate. Because after Erdogan's re-election, Turkish interest rates began to increase sharply. And if in the meantime the lira loses its value, the government will protect you. The problem lies in that last bit, the government needing to protect you. Because if, for example, there were $100 billion worth of lira in these accounts, and the currency lost 10% of its value, well, then the government would be on the hook for $10 billion, Which it's probably going to need to borrow or find from somewhere else, because if it just prints the money then it's going to drive more inflation, more devaluation, and more need to top up these accounts. That means the Turkish government needs a constant inflow of hard currency, better access to foreign exchange. A number of commentators have argued that on the face of it, Ankara doesn't have a debt problem, it has a foreign exchange problem. And Erdogan's government has used an array of strategies to try and raise additional foreign exchange. Foreign exchange that it needs to use for various measures, including defending the Turkish lira. Those foreign exchange reserves have come in the form of loans or swap arrangements with a variety of countries, including Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Azerbaijan, the People's Republic of China, and the Republic of Korea. Plus, the government has borrowed foreign exchange extensively from Turkish financial institutions. And while all of this no doubt helped, it didn't stop the central bank's reported net foreign reserves dipping into the negative briefly in May of this year which is a pretty suboptimal situation to be in if you are trying to smooth your way out of an inflationary crisis. Taken together, it's an economic situation that probably gives the Turkish government a couple of key imperatives. It needs to find ways to reduce pressure on its foreign exchange reserves and domestic inflation. It needs to find ways to bring more foreign exchange into the country. And it will almost certainly need considerably more in the way of loan swaps or other short-term and medium-term funding agreements in order to help it mitigate the pain as it tries to raise interest rates, lower inflation, and bring the economy back into some sort of balance. And it's this pressure which might go some way towards explaining Ankara's seemingly irreconcilable policy position. One commentator writing for the Carnegie Endowment noted that the greatest investors in the Turkish economy continue to be Western economies like the Netherlands, US, and UK but that under the circumstances, severing ties with Russia, which last year became Turkey's top importer, is not a particularly cost-free option. Which brings us finally to Erdogan's policy on the war in Ukraine. And to cover that topic, we should probably start with the most heavily debated element, the nature of Ankara's relationship with Moscow. This relationship has been subject to some pretty dramatic upwards and downwards swings. High points, for example, include the Turkish decision to buy the Russian S-400 air defense system, to invite Russian company Rosatom to help build up the Turkish nuclear industry, and to welcome and encourage Russian tourism. 
But at its lower point, this is a relationship which has involved actual shots being fired. In 2015, for example, the Turkish military shot down a Russian Sukhoi-24 that violated Turkish airspace. And in 2020, at least 36 Turkish soldiers were killed in airstrikes in Syria. Normally, you would presume that friends wouldn't, you know, bomb each other. But the Turks and Russians had originally backed very different sides in the Syrian civil war. And even now, there's still probably a long way to go to improve relations for the two countries on that particular issue on the chessboard. To look specifically at the relationship since February 2022, we can start with some evidence that, on the surface at least, would seem to support the Erdogan-Putin friendship bracelet theory. Erdogan has previously described Putin as a friend, Putin has described Erdogan in the same terms, Erdogan in May described their relationship with Russia as a positive one, more stressing that the Turks did not feel the need to join in EU sanctions on Russia. Quite the contrary, bilateral trade between the two countries dramatically increased in 2022. Russia became Ankara's top trading partner. Total bilateral trade jumped from 34.7 billion to more than 68 billion US dollars. And perhaps in part due to the rapidly diminishing number of travel destinations available to them, Russian tourists and expatriates flowed into Turkey by the million. In 2023, those trade volumes continued to rise yet further. In January to June 2022, the Turks had exported $2.6 billion worth of goods and services to Russia. January to June 2023, that figure was $4.9 billion. Meanwhile, the figure for imports had reportedly passed $27 billion for the Jan-June period. And with Ankara not joining the US and European Union sanctions packages, it was entirely possible for many sanctioned products to pass through Turkish markets on their way to Russia. But as this increase in trade volume played out, there always seemed to be a catch. As trade grew, Ankara was also able to extract a number of concessions from Moscow, many of which, directly or indirectly, helped take pressure off the Turks' foreign exchange reserves. Billions in existing gas debts were deferred, and further gas was allowed for purchase on credit. In response to Rosatom's plan to build a reactor in the country, the Turks required the transfer of 5 billion US dollars in foreign exchange into their banking system seemingly long before the funds would actually be needed for the project. Plus, the Turkish economy vacuumed up Russian energy exports, particularly oil and gas, taking at least some advantage of the deep discounts that followed on from European and American sanctions. Much like India, Turkey is reported to have given Russia an option to sell its oil somewhere on the global market, but often only at a reportedly quite steep discount, and then often only to refine the product into something like diesel and sell that on into the global market directly challenging Russia's own refiners. The Turkish economy has significant oil refining capacity, and so for them, a source of deeply discounted oil has a lot more value than it would if it was just for consumption. It was trade, certainly trade Russia desperately needed, but on terms which didn't really represent Ankara doing Moscow any favours. Where that trade goes from here, however, is an open question. Back in March, for example, Ankara announced that it would be tightening controls on the transit of Western sanctioned goods through its markets into Russia. If fully implemented, that wouldn't close off Russian access to any of these goods, but it would close off one potential pathway for those goods, making further importation more difficult, more rate limited, and probably more expensive. Whether that stated change in policy has a significant impact, however, is something we won't know until we accumulate more trade data. So you can bet I'll keep a close eye on that as the year goes on. At the same time, Ankara has been one of the primary voices pushing Russia to return to the grain deal, providing Ukraine a mechanism to get its own exports out to the international market. Again, none of this represents anywhere near total compliance with all the sanctions imposed by the European Union or the US. But as the Turks are always quick to point out, not being a nation in the EU, they have no obligation to do so. What it does represent, however, is an indication that Ankara's policy may be shifting somewhat away from Moscow and further towards Western economies, who still absorb far more of Turkish exports than the Russians do, and who can, at least hypothetically, offer far more in the field of foreign investment. In short, Erdogan continues to talk with and work with Russia on a number of issues, but on other occasions, he'll act in direct opposition. Perhaps the most public recent example of this was the release of the so-called Azovstal commanders. These were Ukrainian POWs who'd fought at Mariupol, and who Russia had agreed to transfer into Turkish custody, allegedly on the condition that they remain there until the end of the war. And then, in early July, the Turkish government handed them back to Ukraine. 
This prompted an incredible wave of outrage on Russian state TV, Russian official commentary, and on Telegram channels. And it starts to hint at a second part of the equation that helps explain Turkish policy in Ukraine. Namely that, as awkward as it might be given current circumstances, the Turkish government also sees a potential strategic partner in Ukraine. And while there have been a lot of words of friendship directed towards Moscow, and often deep frustration directed towards certain Western capitals, Turkish government rhetoric has often reserved an awful lot of goodwill for Kyiv. The partnership between Turkey and Ukraine basically goes back to Ukrainian independence. And despite Ankara's relationship with Moscow, that relationship has arguably tightened considerably since 2014. Since then, the Turkish government adamantly refused to recognise any of Russia's claimed annexations, publicly condemned what it described as human rights violations by Russian authorities in Crimea, and at a time where many governments were still nervous about providing weapons to Ukraine, Turkish firms were already delivering systems like the Bayraktar TB2. Those systems would be at their most valuable in the opening days of the Russian full-scale invasion. And so the fact they had been provided in advance potentially made all the difference. If your house is on fire, you want to have a hose ready and available, not installed three days later after you're looking at a pile of ash. Another interesting point is that there has been no reporting of Turkish authorities placing restrictions on how these weapons are used. Many Western governments quite publicly state that they don't want their systems used in Russian territory. But we haven't seen any public limitations placed in the same way by companies like Baikar. A variety of munitions have continued to flow into Ukraine from the Turkish defence sector over the course of the full-scale war. Most of these have been purchased from Turkish providers, and some of them have been provided free of charge. Examples reportedly include things like 155mm artillery shells, but we also have visually confirmed evidence of larger systems in service. These, for example, are Turkish MRAPs that we've seen enter Ukrainian service in some numbers, and recently reporting came out of Ukraine suggesting they expected to soon receive Turkey's domestically built 155mm self-propelled gun. The T-155 is the Turkish version of the Korean K-9 howitzer which both makes it a relatively modern piece of kit with a significant global supply chain, but also means that if it is supplied, it's one step closer to Korean arms finding their way directly into Ukrainian service. Another example is Turkish drone manufacturer Baikar. There's almost no doubt that they have enjoyed significant positive publicity because of the performance of their systems in Ukraine and the publicity around it. But the firm has also made very clear that it will not supply Russia, and in many cases, when, for example, crowdfunding campaigns have tried to fund TB2 purchases for Ukraine, the firm has made clear they will not accept payment for the TB2s and have asked instead that the funds be donated to another Ukraine-related cause before providing the drones free of charge. My car is also building a factory to manufacture drones in Ukraine, which is not normally something you'd expect a firm to do in a country that it expected to be defeated and conquered. I focus on Baikar not because the TB2 is the most important weapon of the Ukraine war, far from it. Its effectiveness, particularly outside that initial period where the Russian ground-based air defense system was, um, confused and suboptimal in its performance, has likely been significantly overblown. But at the same time, it's hard for me to imagine a company like Baikar acting this way, if doing so was strongly contrary to the wishes of the Turkish government because not only are there arguments about the firm's strategic significance to Turkish defence policy, but also the small fact that Erdogan's son-in-law sits on the company board as a director. Make of that particular fact what you will. So what on earth is going on here? Ankara is trading with Russia while supplying weapons to Ukraine. Erdogan is talking about the strength of the relationship with Russia, while at the same time actively condemning him for invading Ukraine, and openly condemning in pretty harsh terms Russian policy in places like Crimea. And it's here that we finally have to try and stitch together Ankara's aim in all of this. It would be easy to simply ask the question, whose side Erdogan is on, and glibly answer, well, Erdogan's, of course. But the Turkish government has drawn some strategic lines in the sand when it comes to the war in Ukraine. The first is that the Turkish government very clearly supports Ukraine surviving with all of its territories intact. Ankara has openly advocated for peace talks and a peace, but one which rejects any possibility of Russia retaining any sort of territorial gains. Erdogan has said, and I quote, the return of Crimea to Ukraine, of which it is an inseparable part, is essentially a requirement of international law, end quote. Which, when you look at Russia's stated war aims, basically comes down to saying, we would like to see a peace deal, we would like it to be fair, just, and reflect the interests of all parties, but also the Russian army should bloody well go home and get out of Ukraine. 
Also, just for good measure, Ukraine deserves to be part of NATO. Because I suppose if you're going to start spitting on Russian war aims, you may as well just go all the way. This stance is reflected in some ongoing military aid to Ukraine. And as one other commentator from the Washington Institute commented, quote, to put it simply, Ankara will not allow Kyiv to fall under Moscow's thumb. This is rooted in Turkey's view of Ukraine as an important ally in the balance of power around the Black Sea. But, and there is a very significant but, Turkish policy still arguably embraces what Takan Ildem described as a balanced approach, wherein Ankara maintains the relationships necessary to negotiate both with Kyiv and Moscow, the ability to act as a sort of middleman, and to preserve its economic connections with Moscow, at a time where the Turkish economy could really use them, and the country could really do without any Russian attempts to cause greater discomfort, particularly in other strategically relevant arenas, like Syria and the wider Middle East. And so Ankara holds back a lot of what it could potentially supply to Ukraine. Because while Russia seems willing to tolerate a certain frequency of weapon shipments, if the Turks ever went all out in their efforts to supply Ukraine, the effects would probably be impossible to ignore. Like the Greeks, the Turks have massive reserves of tanks and other armoured vehicles, many of which belong to types that are already in Ukrainian service, plus they have a significant supply of artillery and ammunition, plus there are a variety of Turkish systems that would be particularly valuable. The Turks, for example, have their own domestically built guided MLRS systems with significant ranges. Those could help fill the precision strike range gap that exists between Gimla's rockets and something like Storm Shadow. But arguably choosing not to supply some of these systems preserves Ankara's diplomatic firepower. Because as long as the Turks reserve a significant capacity to influence the war, from a game theory perspective, you could argue that gives Moscow a pretty strong incentive to make sure they never choose to do so. Which brings us to some final reflections on Ankara's role going forward. In terms of what side the Turkish government is on, different commentators contest this characterization. But there seems to be a broad clustering around the idea that overall, the Turkish government is pro-Ukrainian, while at the same time wanting to maintain commercial and diplomatic engagements with Russia. Politically and militarily, they favour a scenario in which Ukraine is not defeated, but also to increase commercial engagement with Russia, and seemingly to extract concessions while doing so. So far as options for engaging with the conflict, Erdogan's government still has a lot of options available to it. Its relationships with both Kyiv and Moscow make it one of the few powers arguably capable of negotiating with both. And it is sometimes capable of getting results, as demonstrated by its brokering of prisoner exchanges or by the creation of the grain deal. So far as how the Turkish government can intervene, it has a lot of dry powder. It will probably continue to act as a sort of middleman negotiator, but if necessary can apply pressure through increased arms shipments, trade restrictions or simply bringing itself more into line with the overall sanctions regime. Expecting Ankara to align itself with Washington or Brussels on every issue is probably woefully unrealistic. But when it comes to advancing their own strategic interests, the options are very much there. In conclusion, Turkish policy is often highly compartmentalised. It deals with different issues as different issues. And when it comes to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that has meant trying to strike what many observers would call a balanced approach, supporting to the hilt Ukrainian territorial integrity, while at the same time keeping economic connections with Russia open. The Turkish government has a number of significant disagreements with many members of the NATO alliance but the country still remains very supportive of that alliance and remains a bedrock of NATO influence in the Black Sea. Predicting future Turkish policy is so difficult precisely because it is so flexible. But given the country's defence industry, significant supply of many weapon systems and ammunition, as well as its unique strategic position and influence, it has a significant ability to potentially influence this war going forward. But each decision to potentially influence or intervene is likely to be guided, first and foremost, by what President Erdogan and those around him ultimately assess to be the country's strategic interests. Okay, quick channel update to close out as I am currently losing my voice. After doing my episode on the Black Sea last week, it became very clear to me that an examination of the topic really wouldn't be complete without looking at the role of the Turkish government in the Black Sea, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and as a member of NATO. I know that compared to some of my previous nation studies, it's focused more on a particular topic, but given how significant that topic is, I hope you understand. I'm now moving into a period of significant movement and potential disruption, which may potentially influence my release content and schedule, but I will try to avoid that, and if it does become inevitable, I'll try to provide some advance notice. Thank you as always for your engagement and support, and I'll see you all again next week.